We're living in an age of change. Ricardo Semler, high-class entrepreneur and thinker from Brazil, poses that the period of capitalism as we know it is running at an end. Nowhere in the world it brought us more equality, and our economic system is completely derailed. Capital did bring us a lot. It made us smarter, but did we get any wiser? Will we succeed in making a new leap forward? This is what you can expect. There are historical reasons why our tribe of humanity is such a slow changer, because change is very, very uh, scary. And human beings don't do scary things on their own. It, it takes something much bigger to force them into change. This is Backlight. Welcome to the next era. We're in Brazil, at the edge of the tropical rainforest, on the grounds of one of the most visionary entrepreneurs of our times, Ricardo Semler. He prefers to be at home, and in spite of his reclusiveness, people are very hungry for his new message. It's been almost 30 years since his first book, about democratizing labor, appeared. His employees didn't necessarily become richer, but all the more happy. That book was an international bestseller. And exactly now that his ideas are so enthusiastically embraced, he is moving on and writing a new book in which he lays out the conditions for a new era, the age of wisdom. We've come from an age of many revolutions, political and then an industrial revolution. We then moved on to the age of information then became theoretically an age of knowledge. But we seem never to arrive at the age of wisdom. And it, it seems to be lacking in many respects. There's a, an enormous contradiction between being smart, being intelligent, and being wise. And we're constantly having to make these decisions. And more often than not, we opt for something that's smart or something that seems like the right thing to do. But most of the time, we realize that it's not the wisest decision in the midterm and the long term and so forth. And um, this has much to do with the fact that our technology is moving uh, much faster than our capacity to be wise. And this wisdom, in many respects, is still very tribal. And uh, the, the easiest way to see that, for example, is when you go to Silicon Valley today, in a California that's completely taken by enormous cycles of drought in which there's no water for a long time. The whole water issue is something that people cannot deal with anymore just by using a smartphone or being very quick with their technology. But it's something that in many tribal ways, again, the person has to be able to look up at the clouds and just hope or pray or dance finally for some rain. In that sense, you can say the, the iCloud doesn't provide any rain. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's very interesting because we've solved all of the issues of how I can store any amount of data, look, find somebody in a, that's hidden inside Hong Kong from here, but at the same time, I can't get a drop from, this, from that iCloud or from any cloud. And we're, we're obliged to go, to go back to very tribal ways, very animistic ways of saying the really important things in, in life uh, we don't control in any, in any way. The same way as you think about I at a school, for example, you say, what are the really important things that we know nothing about? We know nothing about love. We know nothing about death. We know nothing about why we're here. And there's no place in school for that. They say, Look, here's math, here's biology. The cell opens, it divides in two and so forth. And that's the easy part. But the tough part is, how come we can't make it rain? And so in the very same place where people are going crazy with the lack of rain, it's the same place where we feel extremely modern and up to date and to the second, nanosecond uh, doing things. There's an enormous contradiction in that between what's smart and what's wise. What's here, of course, um, is what brings us to this issue of what's left of the very old ways of doing things and what's new. Our 
our five kids, we can't get them interested in, in books anymore because all, all this fits into an iPad. But when you think about how you bring this to organizations as well, the companies today, if you compare them with a hundred and something years ago, you had the, the phase of the robber barons. You had Vanderbilt and Carnegie and Rockefeller and so forth. People who were creating completely new technologies, such as railways across the US or electricity, which wasn't there at all. Uh, and you think about that. What did these people, these heads of these, of these tribes, of these companies, what were they doing? Uh, in many respects, as soon as they had that technology out there, the next thing they tried to do was to monopolize it and to create cartels and to create and to hold it for themselves and to eliminate competitors at any cost and so forth. Today, a hundred and something years later, when you think about what the technology companies are doing and being accused all the time, people trying to break up uh, Google and Apple and so forth, and uh, Bill Gates so many times accused of monopoly and of hard uh, 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 tactics and strong arm tactics to keep. This is really just a modern version of the robber barons because there's no difference between the railroads and the web. There's no difference between electricity and uh, a Google search. These are just completely new technologies that disrupted, but that very quickly came into the hands of very few people. And so today you have a situation where six of the largest companies in the world are equivalent to the 60 poorest countries uh, in the world, which really don't matter anymore. If you say, look, the 60 uh, poor countries in Africa and Micronesia and so forth that no one has heard of or that know about, and you say, look, 40% uh, of them are dying or people's uh, average living age is 33, it, it, it says nothing to us. We just say, ah, oh, what a shame, you know, it's, it's... But then we go on to do something next. And that's the way it was also in the times of the robber barons in which these technologies came. And that took us to other tribal issues. When you think about the totems in Alaska, when you think about the pyramids and what they were there for, it is not very different if you look in the YouTube today and you look at a, a drone uh, a filming of Apple's new headquarters by Norman Foster. So you're seeing a $5.1 billion building by the company that's supposed to be the most mobile company in the world with the most stationary situation in the world, which is to bring in thousands and thousands, thousands of people on the idea that they will interact. But it's the size of 100 uh, soccer fields. The chances that these people are actually going to meet and talk, we are back to our tribal issue, which is we don't interact with more than a half a dozen or 10 people, any of us. And that is our tribal size. That's the way it was in the caverns, in the caves. That's the way it is when we play basketball or football. That's the size of a religious group. That's the size of an of a, uh, army battalion. And in organizations, it's the same thing. We can organize around 1,000 groups of 10 people. But we cannot organize around 10,000 people in one monstrous building uh, that Apple has in the middle of, uh, of nowhere. It's just a demonstration that there's just an enormous excess of, of money there. Uh, it would only make sense to have Steve Jobs buried in the very middle of it, and then you have a pyramid, you know? If, if, you, if you did just that last little bit and you had a sarcophagus for Steve Jobs, you would have solved the problem as, as they solved it uh, three, 4,000 years ago. And so it doesn't have to do with the business. It doesn't have to do with producing anything of any sort. It has to do with these insecurities that we have as humanity, which are basic tribal insecurities. I was looking here at the Chrysler building, for example. When you think about this, the, the Chrysler building was a tremendous um, architectural statement. These were based on the wheels of the cars of Chrysler, and Chrysler was a tremendous company. Look at the power of that in the middle of New York City. But Chrysler doesn't exist anymore a long time ago as a company is irrelevant as a company. Um, but the building is much more important now than the company. And the fact is that this will stay for a while. When you think about the Polaroid building, where's the Polaroid machine camera? But the Polaroid building is beautiful. Uh, and so you go back and back and you think about the, the Versailles Palace or you think about any of this and you realize that um, people are 
much more connected to the ego issue of who's important, who decides alone, what the headquarters looks like. And of course, that's not wise. And it wasn't wise for Chrysler. It wasn't wise for uh, Louis XV in the Versailles either. You know, it wasn't wise for any of the, the people who were in those pyramids. The monarchy that today uh, reigns over the world is that of cash. It's King Cash. Uh, and, and the slogan is, cash is king. And that is the monarchy we all pray to and we all bow down to nowadays. When you think about the East India companies, you think about VOC, um, back when Batavia was a place to, 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 to create or Indonesia a place to take over, what, what happened at the time? The state came and said, look, I can't do this myself. It's too far, it's too complicated. So I'm going to give you the power and you can take uh, church people and Protestants, you can take armies. If you have to kill the people there, that's, that's okay. And then just settle with me at the end in cash because this is a commercial thing. And so the first public corporation really that anyone can think of was the VOC. And the VOC had stock and had shares and had the power of the state to go out there and do that. What is the difference between that and SBM today? who leaves Holland and goes out and corrupts people to build an offshore platform in Brazil, for example. In the end, it's people sitting down and saying, you know, you're right, it was illegal, it was immoral, it was ethical, everything you say. So how much? And you pull out a checkbook and you say, is it $250 million? Okay, here you are. That raises another question. In what sense is a company responsible or are leaders responsible? The responsibility of individuals, of leaderships and organizations is very, very limited. First, because in, in all respects, it's a bit like the mafia. You know, it takes 25 or 30 years for you to get to the capo of the mafia because he's authorizing so many people to kill in his place that you first have to get the killer and then the one who told the killer and then the one who talked to the killer's killer and so forth until you finally get to the boss. And so in organizations, the people who are really the, the owners the real people behind it, many of them don't even hold any kind of executive or fiduciary responsibility. They find and they hire people to take that responsibility for them. And so we've come around this idol, this totem pole, which has King Cash at the very top. Um, and we have to undo this with something that's wiser. It, it, it seems smart, but it's, it's obviously not wise. the ocean Leaving just a memory A snapshot in the family album Daddy You know, this um, Pink Floyd song, it, it, it brings two different things to my mind. One of them is that when you think about the guitar player, David Gilmore, and you think about the variations, and that sound sounds just like him. Everybody else has guitars and millions of people play guitar, but when you hear that sound that way, it could only be him, David Gilmore, which reminds me when you think about a piano as well that has 88 keys but it has an infinite, it doesn't have a certain amount, it has an infinite amount of permutations. And you think about something that's very restricted, like a piano, but you think of all the things that you could do with it. And Pink Floyd here is bringing up this 80s, this whole Cold War issue of we're against totalitarianism and we're trying to break out of this system where everybody's the same and uh, where control is an enormous factor. And now. 
we've been celebrating recently 25 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall as a commemoration to say, well, now we've managed to do away with the enemy and, and control, and now we're in a free society where we can decide everything um, uh, as if we were not being controlled by the issue of money. And if you think about it, the people who were in the East Berlin situation where they were um, controlled and policed and watched all the time, uh, there's no comparison to the amount of control in policing that goes on afterwards, you know? Um, you think about it, there are, in Sao Paulo, for example, there are 28,000 public cameras turned towards the street. Your GPS on your smartphone tells you where, where you are at any moment. Um, there's no issue of privacy anymore, it's completely gone. If you think about the way we've done it and the way we are organized anthropologically, you realize that essentially we've become what I would call tribe people, which are box people. You know, this tribe people that, that we've always been anthropologically are now transformed into boxes. And if you look at our lives, our lives are basically, we live in a box, which is an apartment. We watch a box, which is a, a TV. We go down a box, which is an elevator. We get into a box, which is our car. We go across town to go up that same elevator to work inside a cubicle or a box for the whole day to return. When we're in that place in work, we're in boxes in an organization chart. Everything we're doing is boxed in by rules and regulations of how we're supposed to be. So we've become, in that respect, we've become box people. And that, that's the tribe we belong to at this day. And the box people, which are completely under control. And you think about the rationale of one day we'll be watched and looked, etc., and we don't know who's looking when, we're already there. This is the way our life is. And it seems ironic that we keep telling ourselves now for 20 years that we have to think outside the box. It's impossible to think outside the box when our whole life has been boxed. It's time for us to say, can we think inside the box in a different way? When you think, I have to go on vacation and I'm gonna do a safari in Africa or I'm gonna do something crazy, exotic, etc. And then as soon as you come back, you're back in the box, back in the elevator box, back in the cubicle box, etc. So it's, it's relatively useless. Um, so we've come from that era and we have not gotten accustomed to doing and making changes and thinking inside the box for a change and realizing that our freedom is probably already available to us inside the box. And that's something that I think we haven't realized as people. But wh uh, why do you think that companies send their people to all kinds of courses to think out of the box? I think they realize that when they say, here are the rules and regulations, here's what time you have to come, here's where you're going to be in five years' time, etc. They know you have to wear these clothes, you have to say these things at the meetings that this boxing in, boxing in, boxing in creates people who are automatically working as in this Pink Floyd rationale. People are coming, they come at eight o'clock, then they leave at five and then they do the same thing and they're boxed in in all of the ways uh, in their lives. Some of the things, when you look at companies and you say, what, what does that mean in the end? It means that companies like, if you take, I saw the other day a Samsonite advertisement from the 70s, uh, advertising their luggage with wheels on the bottom. From the time we've had luggage forever, right? We've had wheels for much longer than luggage. Why does it take 20, 30, 40 years of people dragging luggage as anyone, as we did, as our parents did, dragging all this through the airports to finally accept the idea that the wheels outside that little box, which is the luggage, should be used? When you look at um, Gillette went through a very interesting situation, which they had the, the normal Gillette, and then they had it with two blades. And then they, they thought in the 70s, uh, with the two blades, that lasted for a long time. And then in the 90s, they thought, we need to do something radically different. And so they set up uh, dozens of committees, their best people, etc., and spent over $600 million. And the only thing they were able to do was to put a third blade between the two. Breakthrough to the new world of Mac 3 from Gillette. The first triple blade shaving system. And you'd think, you know, what? how many people would it take? Would, would it take one afternoon of three relatively bright people to say, look, let me find a different way. Oh, just put another one in between the three. But it actually cost 
hundreds of million dollars to figure this out. When we think about the Industrial Revolution and what it generated, basically a hundred and something years ago, in 1908, you had the first assembly line in place by Henry Ford, a Taylorist system. That assembly line logic is what we're following to this day. There's no difference there with what we do with our kids at school. We're trying to put millions of kids through a system of give them biology one, biology two, mathematics this, trigonometry, sine and cosine, and send them off into the workplace. So the workplace takes them and says, okay, now you're gonna work two years here, four years here, and you're So we've boxed in the whole system in the assembly line logic, which is still here. But if you're still collecting the past and looking to the past as a solution, having history as a very strong anchor uh, you're unable to move forward because there are historical reasons why our tribe of humanity is such a slow changer, because change is very, very uh, scary. And human beings don't do scary things on their own. It, it takes something much bigger to force them into change. But uh, what kind of big thing could that be? For every human being individual, it's the heart attack, the car accident, the something that happened which was much bigger than you, which suddenly you wake up and say, oh my God, I've been spending all my life inside a box just working for someone else. Oh, isn't there a better way? For humanity in general, it is this, that suddenly it stops raining, suddenly uh, everything goes crazy and you can't control the climate, so that's big enough. If the world were hit by a meteorite, it would be enough. It takes enormous things like that. So we are a bit din dinosaurs in that sense, that we will roam around and do our thing until we're hit by something much bigger than us. And that's true even for the individual who needs a heart attack to wake up to find out that they've been working too much. When you, when you think about the, this tribal effect of the anthropological effect of us as box people who are doing the same thing always, and you put that together with the issue of something that's intelligent versus wise, you see with the investment banking in the 80s, you see it with Silicon Valley later, that the tribes have always said the following. Now, wait a second. Now, if I'm going to have an organization, I need to have the smartest, the best, the most intelligent. And that's how it was looking for the very smart investment bankers, the very smartest people in advertising the, in the 60s, 70s, the very smartest people in the, in the technology age. But what that does is it makes an intelligent case of let me find only the very best, but it ignores wisdom. And it ignores anthropology by saying that we will only be able to work, an organization will only survive if it has a cross cut of humanity. And so if 2% of the world of the population is lazy, we need 2% of lazy in every company. If 2% are thieves that are gonna steal something from the company, we need 2% of thieves. If we don't follow that distribution of what humanity looks like, we're gonna end up with an organization that is uh, outside its own medium. If you take the exact humanity that you find in a given place and you work together and you create some kind of a culture, over time you will have a company that is much more sustainable and very similar to the one in which you tried to make an artificial search for people who were exceptionally bright. These people who are exceptionally bright and intelligent, these are the ones who destroyed the advertising business, then destroyed the investment banking business, and are probably destroying technology as well, because just having the smartest nerds and geeks and who know algorithms that are put together doesn't mean that you'll have a product that's sustainable or a company that's sustainable, because these people are inbred in many respects. These people are a uh, a cut, a very artificial cut, that very possibly, very probably, will not work well together over time. That's what it is, I think. The, the, the too much intelligence together can never be wise. If you're not following a natural, organic distribution of what humanity has been created with and for, etc., uh, you're creating an anomaly. An anomaly of too much intelligence necessarily goes away from 
wisdom because this age-old wisdom was not built on the idea of segregating just the very intelligent ones who will then take over the world. That's never worked. Hey you, out there in the cold, getting lonely, getting old, can you feel me? Hey you, standing in the aisles with itchy feet and fading smiles, can you feel me? Hey you, don't help them to bury the light. in without a fight. I decided to lower the lake a little bit to see whether how much land would show up here on the on the end. Uh, because some days here uh, in Brazil some a month or two are very hot even up here in the mountains and so I decided to create a small beach. And so she's, you know, the box says mountain is mountain and beach is beach. And of course, I'm asking myself, why can't I have a little bit of beach in the mountain? And if it were a very eccentric thing, of course, I'd want to have waves and go crazy. It's, it's something very simple, actually. You just created a little bit of an area here and brought in a bit of sand, which was easy to do. And so now the kids are going to have a little beach on the mountain. The fact is that you can stay within a box and uh, be able to think and, and be free a little bit inside and have a little bit of, of um, leeway to think about uh, life in whatever you do. And this is true for uh, this, as is true for everyone uh, who has a fixed idea of something and realizes that there are many variations and some of them are very simple and they just simply do not coincide with what uh, people imagine to be a mountain in one place and a beach in another but it's just a good way of remembering that within your own box there's a lot of freedom to move i think everyone who does from inside the box they say now i'm going to do something which looks uh, unusual Necessarily, if you put it together with money, then of course it's an eccentric. If you don't have enough money, sometimes you end up uh, being classified as just simply crazy. But if I may say, you can only do this because you have a lot of money. This is uh, a, a version of very little money because it all it for takes, you. <laughs> it takes a truck, a truck with with sand. But of course, in in in, in it doesn't it, fit in my box. No, but the variations that fit in everyone's boxes would be considered equally eccentric. And so to move away from your box really has very little to do with money. But, um, and of course, as you, I even, I've, I've said this sometimes to people who have a lot of money, who, and I say that if you, there's a point where, where you get where you don't have the option anymore to be eccentric. You have almost an obligation to be eccentric because it's how people project their expectations of you and they say, if I had all that money, you don't imagine all the crazy things I would do, which is probably not true. People don't do the, the crazy proportion with, with little money either. And I think it really has to do with how do you move outside your spheres of, of containment uh, in any situation of geography, age, gender or money. The line between uh, normalcy and the line between what people call crazy or out of norm is, I think, to an extent, what has happened to society in this time. You know that it's only been 15 or 20 years, very, very short in the time, in the history of psychiatry, for example, that a sickness or a syndrome called borderline syndrome has existed. A borderline is somebody who has a bit of bipolar, a bit of paranoia, a bit of 
agoraphobia, a bit of depression, but they don't really fit into the psychiatric condition of each of these alone. And it's a very interesting disease because it has to do with this malaise that is in place. People don't know exactly what it is they want. They're not you sure mean, that they you have You mean it. that we, as a society, have, uh, have some kind of borderline? Yeah, I think that this, this borderline explanation, which is valid for individuals, has become valid for society as well. And this borderline syndrome is not something that you can deal with with one medicine or you can be right. You have to keep trying all kinds of medicine. And this is, I think, what we've been doing. You try a bit of communism, try a bit of socialism, try a little bit of uh, 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 personal ideology, tribal ideology, going back to the origins, going forward. And the fact is that we're lost in this, in this moment, in this very bipolar world, which makes any movement to the left or right or putting a, a beach in your mountain property as a sign, oh, he's, this one's gone over the border, you see. But then you come back to the border on another issue. And I think we're all doing this very much as these, these tribes together. And I think that that's new to us in the last 20 years. Not a good idea. Once, once the other ones go crazy, these are probably going to. No, I mean they could attack you easily. They don't know any of you, and if the other ones go crazy, they could feel that they need to show that they're in control. You know, these are boxed dog people. They live half the day only. They spend, but once they're back in their boxes, then. Uh, they start going crazy, like putting our own people in asylums and prisons, etc. People go crazy and they become aggressive. They're not normally very aggressive at all. They don't really bite, but they're, they're, they're big ones, they're dangerous. But it's what happens to people. You box them in too long and they end up becoming a bit like that. Now, if we start moving, they'll go crazy again. If you move that way, it's not too bad. Are you looking for some wine, or <laughs> special one, or? No, I'm trying to be surprised. Actually, I am. Some of them I've lost the label, so it's going <laughs> to it's going to be difficult to find out what it is. Yeah, you see, our box rationale is here as well. All these things are in little boxes, and what happens with anyone who has a bit more wine is that you end up buying a software which has algorithms which controls and separates everything exactly per area. So this is one kind of Bordeaux, this is another and so forth. And you know where everything is, you put a barcode. And when you take a bottle, you swipe it, 
but it will tell you, it will show you graphs and tell you which bottle you have to drink now in the next two months and so forth. So you find that in two minutes you're controlled by the software. It's the software that tells you what it is you have to drink. And so what I do is I just put all the bottles anywhere as they come. I just stick them anywhere. And then, of course, I'm always surprised by what I find. I didn't remember that I had certain bottles and so forth. The price I pay is that some of them I lose. When you look at some of them, you realize that uh, they're gone already. But the fact is that's a reasonable price to pay for the freedom of choosing and having whatever you want, when you want and kind of defeating the software uh, in favor of freedom and surprise and a bit of passion. Essentially, the, the algorithm issue that bothers me is, for example, even when you think that you're in a Google search and that now you're free to go to the entire world, the world is, everything is open to you, you are still within your box because Google will say, wait a second, you're interested in this and this, so let me put the two together and what I'm going to give you is something that was already within your, your rationale. If you take Spotify, the Swedish search system, and for a, a continuous radio. Uh, it asks you, did you like this Duke Ellington song? Yes. Did you like the, no. Did you like Louis Armstrong? Yes. And now you're closing, you're boxing yourself in more and more and more. It's only gonna give you more of what you already wanted and what you already knew. And if there is a new Finnish uh, jazz singer, you will never know because they're not gonna give it to you because they're only gonna give the things that you said that you were interested in. They're gonna put in ads and Google ads and banners and so forth of the things you said. If you decided you wanted to rent a little house in Provence, a year later, everything you open will have houses in Provence for you and nothing in Korea. And so it's interesting that the volume and the opening of the world is in, a, in essence putting everything into a black box or boxing you in every time more instead of giving you freedom. So what if algorithms predict our lives or control our lives? Is there something in the human mind which helps us or which makes the difference? I think that the big issue of control, algorithms, computers, the big things that are around us, they're, the, they're competing with the fact that one of the wonderful things, one of the most interesting things about life is that it is mysterious. The fact that you don't know whether you could be run over 20 minutes from now by a truck, that is part of the mystery. If you could suddenly uh, walk into someone by mistake and that is the love of your life, suddenly find that people were born out of nowhere, died out of nowhere, etc., that is the mystery. If algorithms were able, and big data, were able to predict when you will die, what sickness you will have, etc., I think that the ensuing factor will be a form of um, big uh, abrasive asylum in which you slowly go crazy by the fact that you already know when you're going to die, you already know who you're going to marry, etc. And without mystery, without intuition, without surprise, I'm sure that we humans don't find life worth living. And the fact that we'd love to know certain things is a contradiction. We really do not want to know. Because if you knew, you don't know what to do with that information. You're lost inside your box forever if you know that information. And so the fact that things will happen out of nowhere, completely unexpected, is a fundamental ingredient of life. So every time you're boxed in by algorithm, you're diminishing, you're making life more boring. The very fundamental things we have which are not the technical ones, which are not the measurable, are the wonderful things in life, and they're completely intact. Uh, one good example of this is anyone who's been following chess over the years have followed the, the battle between Garry Kasparov and IBM's Deep Blue. But finally he has made his move. The question to me is not why did he win three or two or any of them. How is it possible for a human to play against a machine that does a million calculations per minute. It should be impossible. And the only reason it's not impossible is that Garry Kasparov has only one thing which the machine does not. He has intuition. And this intuition seems to me to be light years away, even when they talk about artificial intelligence and algorithms being simulating or pretending to be human in more aspects. But the fact is that intuition is something that maybe will take uh, the computers also thousands of generations to acquire. And uh, this intuition is um, the 
essence of the issues of mystery, of surprise, and they explain, somehow not to me because I don't understand it, they explain the big items, which is why are we here, how long are we going to last, why do we die, how do we fall in love. These are all very far from algorithms. I can put algorithms together that say that uh, I seem to like more people who are brunette of a certain age who live in this, who know this, and that, and put them together. That's very easy to do. But to say that that results in love is absolutely far-fetched. This all reminds me of a, of a film by Herzog about 20 years ago, which was about um, Aborigine people in Australia and how they were stopping a mining company from um, destroying the land in which they believed uh, there were green ants that, uh, that dreamed and that they were going to be awoken. And when they, when they awoke by their, by their legends, the, the world itself would end. The interesting part about it is not the obstruction in itself, but the fact that the Aborigine, of course, knew the chances that there were actually green ants below that place was, was, was less of an issue than the fight that went on and ended up in a court in England much, much later, which was how do you put together the fact that we are a humanity that believes that it's possible to have green ants dreaming below a hill, and at the same time, one that has to mine and bring in the latest technology to, uh, to produce something that some other part of the humanity wants to buy. And this, this clash of these tribal issues really puts us uh, back in the thought of what is, what is wise. This is the place where the green ants dream. Get someone to check the ignition cable. I'll see if I can contact headquarters. Calling headquarters, calling headquarters. This is Mintabi. And, uh, and it is a wonderful metaphor of this issue of the technology, the corporation, the government, the big data, um, taking away slowly everything that is, um, that is of a culture that cannot be explained or that is too subjective. And it can be a green ant there, but uh, it can easily be the place of intuition or surprise or mystery in the rest of, of, of our lives. So if we don't design our organizations to make intuition, personal life, balance, the most important part, then the results of selling airplane tickets and making perfume is never gonna work. And that's why when you look at the corporations, you look at the ones that were the giant corporations 100 years ago, 80, 60, 20, they've changed tremendously, which means that the survival rate of corporations is very low. So corporations are a very bad example of something that is good and lasts because they can't perpetuate themselves. If they can't perpetuate themselves and they're constantly changing, if you say, let me see who was on the top of the New York Stock Exchange in 1949 or 69, 89, and compared to today, it's not the same companies. If it's not the same companies, it isn't, doesn't work very well. <laughs> Good. We'll take them all. <laughs> and so we take them as an example, say, boy, these are the, the powerful ones. These are the ones that control the world and so forth. But the fact is that the money is these people are just smarter. These people are not by any means wiser. But because they're smarter, they manage to garner a lot of the money in very few hands. But it's a very dangerous situation, and it's not tenable, it's not sustainable uh, over time. So the, the call is really for saying, let's put intuition, subjectivity back in companies, in places where you can say, I feel that this person would be better. If you take um, Bill Gates in 1983, dropping out of Harvard with a couple of people in the first few years, he did something dramatic, which was to make it possible for you to explore the whole world through a computer. That was wonderful. After that, it has been 30 years since they've chosen the 20, 30,000 brightest, 
And the only thing they managed to do is change the color of the icon. Nothing important has happened ever since. And so we are trading upon the idea that it's one guy. It's Steve Jobs, his genius for design and so forth. And now we have an entire company that's worth $700 billion because of that. Is it able to survive for another 10, 15, 20 years? I'd be surprised. Because it, it was based on one person's rationale of let's do it this way and, and making a passionate and intense effort, which was really of one individual, of a very simple rationale, which isn't there anymore. Go, go. <laughs> courage. Yeah. Courage, courage, courage. I think in many respects, it is about us giving up history as a, as a determination, as it is in big data. You, people will predict what you want to do based on your past uh, and be able to zero off the past and start again. And this burning is really just a caricature. It's a way, a symbolic way of saying, it's all gone. So now that it's gone forever, let's see what you want to do from here on and you can start new things, and that's true for individuals, it's true for countries, it's true for companies, which have to stop the past and start again and see what the new world brings. <laughs>